Caddis Maximus here. I have a better condition on one of these DeWalt DW245s. This is a $3 garage sale find, as we can see. This needs some uh, service, and so this is going to be like a two part service guide. One's just going to be generally checking the brushes, basics of replacing the power cord, looking at the gears, and giving them some new grease. This drill has been pretty punished. We can see quite a bit of damage there on the front end where the side handle goes. These teeth look like uh, a pipe wrench teeth, to tell you the truth. And what I suspect happened is this truck rusted solid. They used a pipe wrench to try to unscrew it. And the collar just slipped off. How Jacob's Chucks works is these are two. This is actually the nut. It's split in half so they can put it together and the collar is press fit over it and it's just friction against this on actual jacobs chucks this area is a little thicker this is a decent dewalt chuck but obviously not decent enough when it's been rusted solid so this is a drill chuck with the collar missing and the two half nuts in there so one part will be how to deal with a chuck like this many times There'll be rust on the spindle, and even if you can get a wrench in there, he will have to hit it so hard that you risk damaging the gears or cracking the gearbox. So this is going to involve cutting the end of the chuck, measuring where the end of the spindle is, or where the spindle stops, cutting the chuck off, which is usually right about here. By the way, this space right here is for when the teeth are retracted, they fit into this space. And then the, the hassle part is taking a grinder and making a slit on both sides so that you can use a chisel or a nut splitter but a chisel to split it so you can relieve all the pressure on the threads and remove it without risking damaging the gearbox this is an old american made at least 20 years old we know that because the uh, when the wall started actually they're made in mexico they're not overseas and they're still pretty good if not really the same but the older american made ones had horizontal slots where the newer ones have drilled holes but this is a drill design that's been around for at least two decades it's just been tried and true this happens to be a dw245 at home depot and many other hard true value and many other hardware stores these dewalt half inch drills are super ubiquitous but they're the dw235s the 850 or the more modern ones are thousand rpm this one, and I do have a much better condition version, but this is like only the second time in like 10 years that I've seen one of these just, you know, randomly out in the wild, is this is the triple gear reduction 600 RPM version. I mean, it's still the 7.8 amp motor. They're up to 8.5, but this is just the rare extra high torque pistol grip drill. And as you can tell, I was like, you know, Look at the condition of this cord and the condition of this drill. I just thought, whatever. And I didn't plug it in. I thought I might keep it for parts for the one that I have. And when I plugged it in, I couldn't believe it, but. It actually runs. The variable speed works just fine. It's totally smooth. No little hiccups or jumps or anything like that. And I've put a little bit of stress on the gears. They don't sound uh, stripped out or anything like that. So even though this is well beat up, it's kind of nice to have a beater. Uh, actual high torque pistol grip drills. Many pistol grip drills run the 600 RPM range of yesteryear, 550, 600, that, those kind of ranges. Some of the Porter cables are 750. And then as motors start packing more and more powerful motors, they just gave you more increased speed, like all the Milwaukee Magnum hole shooters and all that, you know, set the standard at 850 RPM because they just had big enough motors that you got more productivity on most of the average size holes people were using half-inch drills for, running augers, that type of stuff. But DeWalt, and even Milwaukee, the Milwaukee's are really rare, but even the DeWalt have these, the triple gear reduction 600 RPM versions, which are really, people talk about like wrist twisters and wrist breakers. This is actually one of those. I mean, it's geared so low with a 
you know, a one horsepower motor, over one horsepower, that, uh, I mean, these have a lot of juice. They run slower, so you're actually, if you're running larger hole saws and that type of stuff, it's they last longer because it's not running them so fast they start burning up and losing their heat treatment. You can also run things like 2 and 9 and 16 cell feed bits just without issue if you're doing a lot of mixing of mortars and that type of stuff. Uh, using a drill, then the lower speed just gives a little less whipping, a little less stress on the tool so you can do more mixing and it just won't get as hot because the loads offset to more gears and it's just kind of neat these are one of my favorite of the truly high torque the reason they're so rare is they're just not stocked in the stores the walton you know just pushing their most common ones the 235 and so all the dw245s i believe were all ordered I mean, I have never heard of a store. I've been in all, you know, specialty construction supplies, plumbing supplies, lots of places like that sell power tools. Surprisingly enough, you don't just have to go to Home Depot. I mean, there's, once again, uh, construction, plumbing, any kind of craftsman type, uh, craftsperson type woodworking stores. A lot of those kind of places also sell power tools. And it's, you know, there's also... White Cap, which is Home Depot's alternative, which sells like right tools and that type of stuff. So there's a lot more places than just the orange box. But these types of drills are just pretty rare, and that's why I want to talk about it so much, is because um, they're pretty awesome. Anyway, we'll get to doing our maintenance on this unit, which is going to be uh, a pretty big hassle. One of the biggest hassles is that the way the bearing and everything is set up for this truck, you can't just take it apart and press the spindle out. The spindle is narrow and then it winds up and so the bearing is, the spindle is put through the bearing and then the chuck is what keeps this, is like the nut that locks the spindle into the bearing. The bearings put into the housing and then there's a snap ring so if you try to push it out with the press, you'll actually just break the front of the gearbox off. And since it's not a split case drill, you can't just pull out this gear and wrap it, you know, put a couple pieces of wood in the vise and really get a good grip on it. Uh, this situation is really a pretty big hassle for dealing with the chuck. But first, we'll have to deal with this power cord. We'll deal with the back end of the tool, look at the brushes, check the power cord. Take a look at the gears, relude the gearbox, and then at the last, we'll end up dealing with the chuck. Super simple. Three T20 torque screws. Make sure they're cleaned out so they don't strip. Much easier to replace the cord. It's just a two wire, and surprisingly enough, one of the wires wraps up to the top for the reversing switch. Other ones at the bottom. Here's our trigger switch. It is, I believe, it's a 10 amp. It's an 8 amp motor, so, you know, it's reasonably specified. This tool seems to have gained a lot more dirt being kicked around rather than actual use. How we can tell is there's the brushes. You can see that slot. That's where this guide arm or the spring arm stops. So that the metal doesn't contact the commutator when the brushes wear out. We can see that the brushes are all basically right at the top. So this drill actually has not very much run time. Just a whole bunch of... And I found that a lot. Some tools like saws and, and things like belt sanders and that type of stuff will end up having a lot of wear on the motor. You have to be a much more discerning or scrutinizing. Uh, because they're the kind of power tools that are run for long periods of time. Where things like drills, uh, particularly low speed drills, you know, besides mixing applications, you drill your holes and they run in a highly intermittent fashion. And many times the gears and the electrics just don't have very much wear on it, even though the outside of this DeWalt has really been punished. So all we have to do is swap the power cord in the back here. This is going to have an 18 gauge. You may get away with a 16 gauge. And how it keeps from falling out, surprisingly enough, 
is the cord goes through a little convolution here on the side and it has this is the what used to be a screw down clip this is just a clip that pinches onto the cord and sits into a special little area in the handle to help prevent the wire from pulling out this clip is just a little snap you just have to put a little pick or a small screwdriver and it will pop open and you can remove it dealing with these little spring terminals is always one of the most annoying you really need like a sharp o-ring pick a needle maybe a larger sewing machine needle that's a little bit more rigid but the thing is is you actually have to j find something really sharp that you can jam down right next to the wire to release the little finger it's just a barb with a metal contact on the other side and even though it's not my favorite style they I mean that's something that's been used for decades and decades and really is pretty proven but some tools still use screw down terminals which are easier to deal with but when you get used to these now you do have to take the new wire and tin it put a little bit of solder on the end of it because of those spring loaded terminals you can't just have bare strands and shove them in there because they won't they don't have enough rigidity so you do have to put a touch of solder on the end of the wires on the new cable in order to make it work we can actually see what dewalt has done here is they didn't use solder at least on the sol the newer ones they do use solder because i guess it's faster this one they use tiny little copper ferrules to achieve the same effect we gotta remove this yucky electrical tape here and what i found is uh, a lot of dewalt strain release whatever material i think they're actually using it's either a butyl rubber or maybe a silicone but uh, a lot of tools the strain release tend to split apart right where the power cord goes in but i found that on the, a lot of dewalt's they work better this one is indeed split, but it's actually still a viable strain relief. When you're also replacing the power cord, you'll want to keep the end of the current one so that you can strip the wires and cut them to the right length. This isn't too bad since it's such a beat up drill. What I'm going to do is reuse the strain relief and just put a little zip tie around it to prevent it from continuing to tear. Now I only could find an 18 gauge three conductor wire. The original wire with this is also 18 gauge, so it's a little, you know, it's a lot of power tools come with wire cords whose wire thickness is just enough for the amount of power that they're supposed to take, but these type of brush motors can surge massive amounts of power. It'd be better if I use a 16 gauge, but it'll be okay with an 18 gauge. Also, this is like a computer wire, that's why it's not white and black, it's brown. And oddly enough, they use green for the neutral and then yellow with the green stripe, which is like the universal ground wire. It's okay to use a grounded cord because I just won't be applying the ground. The first thing you want to do is just, and because I always forget to do this or put it on backwards, is take the strain relief. And I mean, I've done that several times, just gotten focused on replacing the wire and get it all ready to go back to get get it all together and then realize I forgot the strain relief or I put it on backwards so of course the big end goes towards the wires because that's what's going in the tool and I like to just put that on the power cord first that way I don't lose it the next process is just super simple take your old end of your power cord since this is the hot wire I'm just going to end up cutting this wire to pretty much exactly the same length, length since I have the tip same thing with the second wire is I'm going to have to strip a little bit of this insulation and cut it to the same length, solder the ends, and put it all back together. One thing is you'll want to, once you get the ends soldered, you'll want to actually push them into, I'm forgetting which holes this came out of, but you'll want to push them in and get them attached that way you can get this little cord lock in the right position after you get this attached and bend the wire through the convolution now that we've done that all we do is 
Now, we're, now that we've tinned the wires, all we have to do is push them in. I got a little booger on that one, but it's not a big deal. It can be difficult to actually get a good enough grip to push these in by hand, so it's advisable that you just get a pair of pliers and use that method. Get a decent little grip on the wire, or the best that you can, kind of like so. And just push it in, and then give it a little bit of a tug and a wiggle to make sure it's, that it's fully seated. When it comes to this little cord pinch, since pliers open this way, you may want to get some slip joints or some channel locks that way they operate more parallel and it's better to grab it this direction because otherwise the thing contorts and it has two snaps two teeth so you and since it is a cord retainer it's pretty tight and so you're not going to be able to like pinch it with your fingers to get it tight enough you're gonna have to put it on and then use pliers like so to get it to snap fully and you know you'll have it snapped fully when it properly pushes back into that little slot in the handle. Opening up the gearbox is pretty simple. You just remove those three screws and it usually comes apart. Pretty easily. So the evidence of why this truck was so rusted definitely shows up inside. I was looking at this. The grease tends to protect pretty well, but we can see some corrosion and that's supposed to be a little needle bearing like these other ones. And that has a fair amount of corrosion on it. We'll see. You'll just have to try to clean it up and lube it the best you can. And we can see evidence of the corrosion here too. There, This is a little gasket. You want to, to pull out the gears you need to remove it. But this is a paper gasket. Super delicate. So you got to be super ginger. And it's a good idea to put the gasket in the same side. But I just use a little precision screwdriver and you just slowly work around, like particularly around these posts, and just slowly work around it until you're able to get the gasket up. You're being real ginger, so you're preventing, you know, as soon as you have a little lip, you're just using the thin edge of the screwdriver just to help peel away and break up, break the gasket off the surface without actually causing it to tear and that way you don't have a torn up gasket even if you do have a tear it's pretty well captured in here so you know it won't be the end of the world pop the gasket out if you're wondering about this so for a while DeWalt had these push buttons they had keyless chucks but to give you more grip, the whole collar was a hand grip, and then they had a push button to lock the gears, and it was just a little finger that went in and jammed into the gears, but people had a lot of problems with that. Accidentally hitting the button, so DeWalt did away with that. And we can see just a little bit of rust on that end of the gear too. Come on, camera. We can see the gears themselves don't have much wear. There isn't like a real big notch or anything on them. So they appear to be in pretty decent condition. And another nice thing is we can see how much thicker. First stage of the motor is pretty thin. Then the second stage you can see the teeth get thicker to interact with this second idler gear. And then you can see the teeth on this one are really thick. And so they progressively get thicker, the increasing amount of torque. So the main spindle gear just has a really coarse and thick teeth on it. Now most drill manufacturers, what they do is, since you have helical cut gears, they kind of have a thrust because since they're slightly angled, they want to get pushed apart. And DeWalt is one of the few, most just use a steel washer because it's really not that big of a deal. Even companies like Milwaukee do. But DeWalt does this thing where they put in these little radial needle bearings to th for the thrust bearing. So you have a needle bearing to handle the forces this way, and a radial needle bearing to handle the forces this way. And it really helps contribute to them being such smooth running drills. 
And back to this rusted bearing, it wasn't super bad, but the easiest way to deal with it, since I don't have the you know, bearing to replace it, you can pull out the motor, remove the brushes, you can pull out the motor and push it out, so you can replace them. As I just use a little bit of lube or a lot of light oil, let it soak in there for a little bit, and then just use Q-tips. kind of spin the bearing around and clean it and you just have to repeat that process a few times with several q-tips that way you can kind of work as much of the old rust and grit out as possible and do the nature of it being a drill and stuff it's not going to be the end of the world if it's this particular bearing's not perfect and after some this was that rusted bearing as you can see I actually got it to shine up pretty well. Uh, I think that's just going to be just fine considering this is a beater drill. So there, go, there we go after all that work. Still looks pretty beat up but now the power cord has been replaced although I should I'll eventually end up re-replacing it with a 16 gauge so this 18 gauge. Brushes were good. Glad I looked in that gearbox not only didn't need new grease somehow water had seeped in and you're wondering if how that happens like around the gaskets it's this gets left outside it heats up with the sun there's a slight expansion of the air pressure it gets rained on so there's this static water sitting along the seam the gearbox ends up cooling off it creates a vacuum and actually sucks in some of the water that's how it really got in there because these are relatively well sealed the gaskets the screw heads seal pretty well sealed bearings on the front and back Make sure all the needle bearings are moving smoothly. So now this is ready to work, and in the next video, uh, and I'll end up titling it How to Remove a Rusted Drill Chuck the Hard Way, because that's what it's going to take. I have to cut up the end of the chuck off. I'm going to have to grind a slot really carefully so I don't end up damaging the threads of the spindle or the gear case. And having to try to split this. I'll give it a shot by finding a rod or a chuck key once I knock these out and get the, there's actually still a bit stuck in here the only reason the half nuts are retained is because there's still pressure against them I'll just knock them out with a chisel. Use a chuck key remove the center screw and just see if I can't knock it and if a couple of good strikes won't do it then I'll end up doing the next video. And those are curious uh, actually I have like some hand tightening chucks that type of stuff which would be fine on a drill like this because you can just power tighten them and that's what I'm gonna end up doing is this is a Rome so this is just like the Jacob 700 series this actually came off of a I think a broken DeWalt cordless drill but this is one of these chucks that has the carbide teeth and that's gonna be pretty optimal this like I said, this thing has so much torque that there's no reason to have a lock button. You can just grab the chuck and forward and reverse to torque it and untorque it. I was going to put on a heavy duty 33 series Jacobs chuck, but for how beat up this drill is, I don't actually want to sacrifice a chuck that's uh, so nice. And to give you an idea, this is a half inch thread by half inch capacity chuck but there's different series like this Jacobs 34 series which is also a half inch chuck but it's a three quarter inch spindle it's like for drill presses and both of these are half inch capacity chucks just to give you an idea of what really is heavy duty and in industrial whenever you see the chucks they have they look like a clover leaf instead of a triangle you know that there's just a massive amount of extra steel versus their capacity Caddis Maximus here. I just did a servicing video on this DeWalt drill and decided to make a video dedicated to how to remove a rusted chuck. This chuck got totally rusted, locked up. Somebody tried to use a pipe wrench, I assume, on the chuck collar. That would be this rotating part. And it came loose and has fallen off. And so we're just left with the internals of the chuck. Many times, especially when they're rusted, these chucks are on there so tight that even if we carve flats and put a wrench in there 
or even carve six flats and put an impact socket on it, it's after we knock out these half nuts because the collar just presses over. This is the nut that draws the teeth in and out. It's split in half. It's actually known as fractured so that it can be precisely aligned when you put it back together. The collar, collar is just press fit over it and just relies on the friction for the collar to deliver the forces to that nut. This is not a Jacob's chuck. It's a little, this nut is a little bit wider than a genuine Jacob's chuck. So in this situation, when this rusted, even if you can get a good grip on it, you're going to end up putting so much force trying to, you know, after you get the lock screw out, that you risk blowing out the gears, stripping the gears, or actually cracking the gearbox. We can already see pipe wrench damage on this. If somebody trying to do that, fortunately the gears are okay on this DeWalt. And this is a DW245. This is one of the much more rare people seeing all the job sites and you know Home Depot and all. I think even Lowe's pretty much. Everybody's seen these DeWalt half-inch drills, but they're all the 235G, the double reduction, 850, or the newest ones are 1,000 RPM. This one is actually triple reduction, and we can see 600 RPM. This is an actual wrist twister. This is uh, this one of the much more rare uh, pistol, high torque, actually high torque. They're already pretty high torque, the ones that they sell in the box stores. But these 245s are just much more rare because they're, you know, it's like barely even any like construction or plumbing supplies, uh, woodworker supplies. There's all sorts of stores that sell power tools besides like Home Depot and Lowe's. But the DW245, which I believe is still sold to this day, this is, they've been making it for more than 20 years. We know this is an old American made one because. The vents or horizontal slits, when they started being made in Mexico, and they're just as good a quality, really. The, but once they started being made out of the country, they switched to a ventilation system that had a series of holes. So whenever you see these horizontal lines, you know it's actually one of the more original, late 90s, early 2000s American-made ones. The 245s are special order because... A lot of people, you know, if they're just going to get a bigger, what's known as a spade handle drill rather than something that has like this a 7.8 amp motor uh geared all the way down to 600 rpm is really pretty stout but i really like them because um for exactly that reason that they are a very they are a truly high power compact drill so anyway we're going to deal with this chuck i'm going to use this old rom which actually came off another dewalt drill it has the carbide teeth and this moves so slowly and just has so much torque that it's no problem just using a keyless chuck and just power torquing and untorquing it. They did have these where they had a push button that would just send a pin into the gear so you could press the button and then hand lock when they had a keyless chuck. but. On the key chuck versions, they put in this provision, and then the wall end up just completely getting rid of that option because so many people were accidentally hitting that button on the keyless versions and jamming the stop into the gears, and the wall was getting a lot of warranty claims about blown out gears because they the stop button was just too easy to press when you were just holding the drill. So the wall just did away with that. So anyway, I actually have another one of these in much better condition, but it's just kind of nice to have one of these as a beater. Just did a restoration video, or not a restoration, but a service video, and the brushes and everything else is, and the gears are just fine. So really, this drill is worth the effort to put on a chuck, and so we'll get to doing that. And just to reiterate, like I did in the end of the last video, I'm not going to use a premium American-made Jacobs 33 series chuck. This is pretty nice chuck, and for how beat up this drill is quite frankly i'm just not going to sacrifice such a nice chuck and arguably this one with the carbide teeth might even be a better situation for the purposes of this drill rather than having to deal with the chuck key although the chuck keys are proven and since i like to mention it for people who aren't in the know both of these are half inch capacity chucks but this is a half inch spindle this drills half inch 20 thread so that's what this chuck is but this is a three-quarter inch thread 
by half inch capacity. It's for more like drill presses. So just to give you an idea, not all Jacob's chucks are created equal because both of these drill chucks are half inch capacity. But as we can see, um, there is just a slight difference in the amount of material and steel in these chucks. I almost forgot to mention. So if your chuck isn't in this situation where you still have the collar on it, uh, it's a tut. You will have to use a cut a grinder or something to split the collar in two places, and then use a punch or a chisel to knock it, or a chisel to split that collar. If the teeth are retracted, then they come out at an angle into this gap, and there's actually a little recess on the inside of the collar, so the teeth can end up trapping the collar. So, if you have the uh, gear puller that can get under it, you can. Try using a gear pull to actually pull the sleeve off. Otherwise, you have no choice but to cut along two edges and then use a chisel to split it to remove it. And that's the essence of what we're going to have to do with this is measure how far out the spindle is. The spindle usually stops the way these are designed right about where the shelf is. Let me zoom in a little bit. Right about here. So we're going to have to cut the front of this chuck off and then use like a Dremel cutoff wheel to make a slot, two slots, one on each side. We're gonna support it on some kind of block of steel when we do that. And we're gonna use a chisel to hit it and sp split it apart so we can unthread the remainder. In this situation, we do need to get the lock screw out because maybe I might get lucky to be able to unthread it. And that's gonna involve first knocking out these half nuts on this one never experienced that before the half nut was actually broken in there because i've never had it where it was just a they're called half nuts because they come out in halves but this one is coming out in thirds a little bit tough trying to manage this i only have two hands just want to make sure the spindle support on the piece of wood so I'm not hammering against that. I'm using, and then we're just gonna drive this out. And it will take some effort, but it's actually driving the one on the opposite side out, which is just fine no matter we're going to drive out the remainder of this. And after we do that, now we're going to have to get some punches and drive. We're going to have to drive the teeth back because they can't come out at the same time. They have to be driven back, and then we're going to individually drive out forwards each of the teeth to completely remove them. Finally got those out of there and never really encountered that. The split nut totally came apart. So now the next step is to dry these teeth back in. Pretty badly rusted. We're gonna drive those back in and then try to remove the counter threaded lock screw in the middle of the chuck. And something this rusted, you're gonna to wanna to hit it with a lot of penetrating fluid and let it soak in for a while. On these DeWalt's, it's a Torx T20 screw. I just drove the teeth back just far enough, basically flush with the end of the chuck. That way I wasn't hammering too hard because I don't want to damage this front bearing. You want to use a pick to really make sure that that fastener is cleaned out as good as possible because a lot of times they're jammed up and remember, forward direction to remove them. A counter locking chuck screw loosens to the right and tightens to the left and was able to get this out of there and that's good for a couple reasons one when I cut off the end of the chuck I won't have the stub of the center lock screw to also deal with and then secondly I'll be able to reuse this lock screw when I replace the chuck so I'm adding this section to this video just because It made a liar out of me. I've had so many times 
or several times in the past before I even had a YouTube channel where trucks like this just weren't going to come off. One of these days I'll end up having a video showing where I cut them off, but I figured, well, might as well give it a shot. I drove these teeth in. Found an Allen socket that was about the right size. It totally fit loose. And uh, figured it wasn't going to do anything, but I figured, oh, I give it a few light, a few hit, light hits. Nothing that I'm worried about damaging the gears, but maybe the truck will come off after all it's been through in the light amount of banging. Not enough to damage the bearing once again. On a slightly more powerful <laughs> impact, this is a slightly more powerful than a little driver. And like three hits and the truck just came right off. So I'm adding this section into the video of reattaching the new truck. I like to use impact drivers. That way I can put on the truck. I'm not going to be impacting with too much force. It will make sure there's not little boogers such as that on the mating surfaces. Make sure they're nice and clean so the truck goes on straight. Interestingly enough, if you look here, I'm going to add this to the video too. The threads are like cut off, so I don't know if that's just a issue or maybe DeWalt has been it intentionally cutting off the threads because the threads are supposed to be sharp just to provide a little bit more relief, figuring it holds the chuck on just as well, but provides a lot less friction for removing it. Just get the chuck started. Use an impact driver, which is just enough to not th not only thread it on, but just to make sure it's cinched. And I don't think this drill ever came with this chuck, but we can see an issue there where it just, the chuck is actually technically tight, but it's right up against the housing. So, if that happens, you're going to have to find some kind of washer just to give it a little bit of space. Standard Jacobs chucks don't have that issue. It's just that on this particular chuck, you can see there's very little protrusion from this collar to the mating surface. Most other chucks, you know, they have just a bit more protrusion. And we can see that that spindle flat is just a little bit more recessed. And by the way, you can just see the snap ring that's in there. It's the only way to really remove the spindles to take off the chuck. Now you could replace that bearing, that type of thing. And I misquoted earlier, apparently that gear is press fit. So once you take it apart, you can press the spindle out. But you still wouldn't want to put that load right on that inner lip there. You still want to pull out the whole bearing. Or at least pull out the snap ring and put a socket over it so it's being supported by the bearing, knowing that you're going to have to replace it. And in my magical washer bin, I did happen to find, like, the exactly the right washer. It may have been a shim washer for a drill truck on some kind of half-inch drill. Make sure this is all cleaned up. Make sure this is clean. And this happens to be just the perfect washer. Not very thick. It's only like 10 or 15 thousand thick. But that turns out you can just see the gap there and barely up top. But that was the size that it needed. And that should be nice and cinched down. Didn't need to have the chuck very tight. And then just to do the same thing with the lock screw. Just give it not full power bumps, but put it in. Remember that it threads in in reverse. And that's servicing uh, the Walt DW245, kind of in a semi nutshell. This is kind of what I do with my time and figured I'd just make more videos about it. I made a general video about servicing electric drill, but. Might as well, you know, as I spend time getting these old tools and trying to fix them up, kind of like that DeWalt uh, worm drive saw, the DWS-535, just take it on the journey with me and maybe might help somebody who's more specifically interested in videos dealing with the DW-235-245 and the other 3H drills and all based on the body design. There's just going to be slight differences in the gearbox. Anyway, thanks for watching. 
almost forgot. Doing this power tightening method with the higher speed half inch drills, you can, you know, kind of get some hand burns. If you ever hear that sound, it's just the ratchet needs to be reset. But in particular on this 600 RPM, it's really easy to just go at a low speed and just apply all the torque. You can just grab this as hard as you want and get it as tight as you ever could on any cordless drill with the one-way clutch and of course breaking it's pretty easy just like so.